They say the second C in Jacob's slavery means clutch, but in reality, it means Clancy. Your Locked On Hurricanes, your daily podcast on the Carolina Hurricane, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to a Thursday edition of Locked On Hurricanes, your team every day day part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thank you to the everydayer for making this your first listen of the day. I am your host, Zach Martin. Really excited to bring you another great show over here at Locked On Hurricanes. So for the show, again, talk about Jacob Slavin's nominee for the King Clancy Memorial Trophy. Also going to throw it over to some guys from the Locked On NHL Prospects who Talk about a couple players that recently made their debuts for the Carolina Hurricanes in the course of the very end of the show. We're going to do some favorite regular season moments from fellow Carolina Hurricanes fans. But before we get into any of that, today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I am in it. I have a competitive side, and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go. Now free on the App Store or Google Play. And, yes, so the starting off the show, like I said, Jacob Slavin was on Wednesday announced to be the team's nominee for this season's King Clancy Memorial Trophy, which is given annually to the player who best exemplifies leadership qualities on and off the ice and who has made a significant humanitarian contribution to his community which if you're talking about any guy who's worth that nomination for the King Clancy, it is Jacob Slavin because as on Wednesday night, Jacob and his wife Kylie actually were hosting a celebration concert in Raleigh uh, after they reached $1 million raised in partnership with the International Justice Mission in the fight against human trafficking and Honestly, like there's no other better person to give it to than Jacob Slavin. Just the fact of what him and his wife have done and just being able to do everything that they've done, even with the fight for freedom, which is their like it's their way of supporting the international justice mission. And if you make sure to go check that out, fight number four of Freedom 74. And it's just their little like nonprofit, their little not a little, but like their big project on how to fight human trafficking and the fact that they made or raised a million dollars, it really speaks to the character of Jacob and his wife. And it goes to show that that him getting the nomination just makes the most sense. And that's one of the things that you have to love about Jacob Slavin. On the ice, he's a leader. Off the ice, he's you know, doing things that you know helps benefit – not just the community in Raleigh, but in communities as a whole, it, it, you know, locally, internationally, and all that good stuff. And, you know, big congratulations to him on his nomination and big congratulations to him and Kylie, like I said, for being able to host that concert to celebrate raising $1 million with the justice of, you know, just fighting human trafficking. So big congratulations to him and all that good stuff. And, could not think of a better person to do that. And not just even for the season that Jacob Slavin had as well, like just to be able to do what he's done on the ice for the Carolina Hurricanes and everything else that he's really done in terms of just being a role model on and off the ice. Just looking back on the season as a whole, he had six goals and 31 assists for 37 points in 81 games. So it was a plus 21, scored two short-handed goals, just being basically proving why he's one of the best defensive defensemen in the league. Eight penalty minutes all season. He's already won one Lady Bing and should have won a second one already because he won in 18 19. Should have won a second one. Unfortunately, did it. You know, hopefully he'll be up for another Lady Bing again because he's one of those guys. He's one of the best shutdown defensemen in the league. And just being able to stay out of the penalty box and be able to do the defensive plays like he does on a nightly basis. There's no reason why he should go for that nomination as well. And honestly should have a couple of Norris trophies, but that's a discussion for later, but to be able to 
be the team's nomination for the King Clancy, it goes to show the character that Jacob Slavin is. And like I said, it's a reason why he is the most deserved guy to be nominated for the King Clancy. And hopefully he gets it. Hopefully he gets the King Clancy Memorial Trophy and just keep showing why he is a great human being on and off the ice. And hopefully when it's all said and done that he actually does get that. So one of the off the show with that, because it's a, it's a big, you know, it's, it's not one of the top end trophies if you, if people want to look at it that way, but it's one that it just goes beyond the game and it definitely needs to be celebrated and honored just even for being nominated. So, like I said, it's something that's worth noting. It's it's a great thing to kick off the show with. And I think everyone's really going to be uh, excited for the segment segment, uh, which goes over the uh, prospects of Scott Morrow and Bradley Lindo uh, over on the Locked On Angel Prospects podcast with Hadi Kalakesh and Sebastian High. So that's going to be a great segment segment, and we're going to get to that here in just a second on a Thursday edition. Of Locked On Hurricanes. Guys, I need you all to listen up for this huge announcement. I've been tracking the leaderboards every day, keeping my eye on the scores, putting all my heart into it, and I'm super pumped to announce I am finally on top. That's right. Obviously, I'm talking about the hit mobile game Monopoly Go. You've probably heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It is a great mobile twist on a classic Monopoly. And you can play anywhere, anytime. You explore hundreds of Monopoly boards from Las Vegas to Camelot to the moon, all while ranking in a huge fortune. Charge rent on iconic properties just like classic Monopoly. You can charge your friends rent on your iconic properties or go after their Monopoly money by pulling bank heists and taking wrecking balls to their landmarks. But my favorite part is the leaderboards, where you see who's a Monopoly tycoon and who's gone bankrupt. So go get yourself on the charts. Download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store, and Google Play. Welcome back to segment two of Locked on Hurricanes, your team every day. So before we ended the the first segment, uh, you know, reference the fact that guys over at Locked on NHL Prospects podcast, Heidi Kalakesh and Sebastian High, talked about the Carolina Hurricanes, more specifically Scott Morrow and Bradley Nadeau, and I really thought their takes on those two guys are very, very interesting. So we're going to play the clip from them talking about those two players, and then we come back, I'm going to give my thoughts on their assessments of two of the highest high-end prospects for your Carolina Hurricanes. I think we can start with Scott Moore because he's, he's the only one of the bunch that's made his NHL debut, uh, and it looked uh, great. Let's start with the profile of Scott Moore. Um, you know, all that good stuff, size, handedness, all that stuff, uh, how many points he put up in in, uh, in his final year in the NCAA, what the projection has been over those two years. So talk me through it, Sebastian. What's the scoop on Scott Moore? Yeah, so Scott Morrow is a six foot two, hundred and ninety four pound right shot defenseman, uh, turned twenty one years old in November, and as you mentioned, he just signed his ELC with the Carolina Hurricanes and made his debut just on a Friday night. He played an excellent game, but didn't record any points just yet. But uh, this season with UMass, he played thirty seven games and logged six goals and twenty four assists for thirty points, which was his low lowest point and goals uh, goal total of his college career uh, with his two previous seasons being very, very similar production wise, but just a, a little notch better. So his rookie season was excellent with 13 goals and 33 points. And uh, as a sophomore, he had nine goals and 31 points. So the production was quite steady for him, always right between 30 and 33 points a season. And uh, yeah, it was just a consistent dynamic force from the blue line for the university of Massachusetts. And, and is now making uh, the jump to the professional ranks. So what makes Scott Morrow such an intriguing prospect, and what can Carolina Hurricanes be excited for here? 
what made him so interesting the whole time for me was the offensive acumen, the ability to understand how to create offense in the offensive zone and off the rush. Like that was a major, major part of his offensive toolkit. Um, and that's only grown from then. The other major thing about his game is, uh, you know, the way it developed over the last few years, he went from a guy who pushes a pace at every puck touch, who carries pucks across lines and drives offensive uh, defensive formations, puts them on their heels and all that stuff from the blue line to a really well-rounded two-way player. I think he's really improved his defensive game. He's gotten a lot more comfortable defending the rush, uh, defending his zone. You know, those small habits, those small, um, those small tools that you usually develop with time he has. Um, so it, it's really interesting to see him progress the way he has and it's been really interesting to see him kind of get his signing in and, and play his first NHL game and he played really really well I don't think he got a point in that game but um he out game scored uh everyone on the Carolina Hurricanes which is ridiculous for a, a rookie playing his first NHL game having a better game score than Jakob Slavin is is just absurd isn't it it is. I mean, hey, like you really can't complain with that kind of a debut, especially like coming late in the season when hockey is getting uh, pretty close to playoff style. So, yeah, Scott Morrow is excellent. Like, as you mentioned, the offensive acumen is something very special in his toolkit. He is so deceptive with the puck on his stick, constantly creating from the blue line. And uh, like him and Lane Hudson were, were, were truly the, the two most dynamic blue liners in the NCAA among drafted players this season. I think Zeev Booyam would be making a run at that too uh in that category but uh yeah. yeah like two of the most like electrifying defensemen in the entire collegiate ranks have just made the jump to the nhl and uh scott morrow is going to to be very interesting to kind of track uh and how he progresses with carolina he'll be able to take over some power play minutes uh with that team moving forward and uh yeah i'm very excited to see what kind of role he has now in the coming weeks already yeah, absolutely. It's going to be really interesting to see him kind of progress there with Carolina. I always, you know, Scott Moore was a guy I had in my first round and well within it. I think I had him in the, in the early 20s in my rankings in his draft year in 2021. Uh, and he's only taken off from there and kind of improved his, his game and uh, added tools to his game. So I think that in retrospect, this might look like one of the best picks of the 2021 NHL draft. Uh, but moving on to Bradley Nadeau, who was another player who I was really high on early. And you weren't sold uh, until you started watching a bit more of him. And all of a sudden, you're on the same page as me. And you actually outranked me on Bradley Nadeau. He ended up higher on your list than mine uh, last year in 2023. Uh, so talk me through his game, what makes him so interesting, and why it took you a while to to get on, on the Bradley Nadeau hype train. Yeah, like, like w with Bradley Nadeau, like the the raw skill was always tantalizing, and and he's always been very intelligent on the puck, but it had it wasn't fully coming together. And against BCHL competition, it really had to be overwhelming in order to really convince me. And uh, I spend a lot of the season like being a bit more appreciative of Adar Suni of his teammates' game, uh, yeah. in in the consistency and the physicality and the projectability of it, but. As the season wore on, the tools just kept refining for Bradley Nadeau, uh, one of the smartest players from that 2023 draft class, one of, one of the most lethal shooters from that draft class, one of the better puck handlers from that draft class. The overall offensive toolkit was just tantalizing. And in the end, I had him ranked 19th overall. So when Carolina picked him at 30, I thought that was excellent value and uh, a real, real nice swing on upside. And uh, here we are, 10 months after being drafted, he has his uh, his NHL contract. And that came after a season of uh, 37 games uh, in where he put up 19 goals and 46 points as a freshman at the University of Maine. And this is a 5'10", 172-pound center or winger i think like he can play both he's intelligent enough to play down the middle but his like kind of speedy and undersized game could also lend itself to the wing so he's very adaptable offensively can play any of the three forward positions quite well and uh yeah he's he's highly intelligent highly skilled and uh the, like the sky's the limit with this player, especially in, a, in an organization like the Carolina Hurricanes. I think that uh, the future is very, very bright for, Nind for Nindeau. Yeah, for sure. And for me, what really stands out with him is he, he's got one of the best shots uh, in the yeah. NCAA. And, you know, last year, I really put emphasis on the fact that Nindeau's probably the best goal scorer um, outside of, you know, Connor Bedard uh, in the in the 2023 class. 
Uh, but yeah, it was really interesting to see him kind of go about his season, kind of develop these tools uh, even more, um, round out his game, add more kind of projectability to the overall toolkit. Like there was a, a lot of major steps in Bradley Nadeau's game that made him uh, quite an interesting prospect uh, moving forward. He, and him and uh, him and uh, Josh Nadeau, his brother, formed one of the best one-two punches in the NCAA as well. Um, the University of Maine doesn't have the amount of supporting cast that other programs have, like Boston College, of course, Boston University. Um, even you know you could put Denver and UMass and uh, and Michigan in that in that kind of bunch of teams that really have great, uh, well-rounded rosters. That's not really the case for the University of Maine, but Bradley Nadeau has been a real bright spot on that team. And playing with your brother, who you've played with before, I think can definitely help in that element. Um, and yeah, I mean, the projection with Nadeau is really interesting. You could see him become a 25, 30, 35 goal scorer in the NHL within the next like four or five years, uh, I think is a realistic kind of projection of where his game ends up. Does he end up playing as the whole ride at the University of Maine? Maybe. Um, but I say, uh, sorry, the, the, could he have played the whole ride at the University of Maine? Probably. But I think, you know, getting him out of that program, getting him into the AHL, especially, and we'll get into that in a second, especially if Carolina has a concrete plan for how their AHL team's built, the, the cast are going to have there, how much their development staff's going to be able, able to work with their prospects, um, I think is a great idea. Big thing to the guys over at the Locked On po- uh, AHL Prospects, uh, you know, YouTube or show, and they're right. You look at how the Hurricanes got Scott Morrow, and then not that not too long after they go get Bradley in the dough, and that's why you see where they're at in terms of their projections of how that well they played in college. Because you look at Scott Morrow, and they were seeing it perfectly. The fact that even Sebastian said it. It's like you saw that the production was consistently there. Was it the hair off than what you have saw in the past? Yes. But also at the same time, too, in terms of how his production was and how he played over that time, and the way Hottie talked about it was you see that he went from just a purely offensive-minded defenseman you know, you got guys like Bray Shea, Tony D'Angelo, if you look at it that way, possibly Dylan Coughlin, guys who are shell focused on the offensive side of the game, Brent Burns and stuff like that, and who can play some defense. And the fact that Scott Morrow turned it into a 200 foot game, two, two way defenseman, and that's the kind of defenseman that Rod Burton more loves to have. He, he likes to have guys who can play that offensive side but also how to play really strong structured defense. And that's what you see with the Carolina Hurricanes. And that's why the Carolina Hurricanes defense is so good year in and year out. They're always usually in the top five, top three in goals for a defenseman, but are also one of the most structurally sound defenses in the league. And if they're playing how the system works out where you can play, man, it is one of the toughest defenses to crack. And that's why you see teams – you know, barely, you know, sometimes only get maybe 20 shots a game. You know, a lot of teams get shut down to one shot, like single digit shots per period. And that's kind of what you see. And the fact that Scott Morrow kept his points on a year in, year out basis around the same. Yeah, they weren't as much as they were at the beginning of his career and stuff like that. But you see overall that they were in the consistently around within five points of each other, five goals, all that stuff. But the fact that his all round, his well-rounded game grew at UMass. And now you're going to see it turn into the hurricanes with Tim Gleason as the defense coach or wherever him and Bradley Nadeau go in terms of the AHL. Cause you know, there's going to be, there's a plan in place. You know that they're going to have an American league hockey team where it's going to be the question, but if they're if he's not up in the NHL next season, rest assured they're going to be with an AHL team that Carolina is probably going to have an affiliate with. And in terms of Bradley Nadeau, I mean, yes, it was probably one of the best shots in the NCAA. You know, Sebastian even talked about 19 goals, 46 points. You know, in his in his freshman year, and Hottie even said it too. Like, could he have stayed all four years in Maine? Yes, but for the fact that in his freshman year got the most points over 40 since like 2006, 2007, the most that in that high amount of points in four, since 14, 15. 
And let's not even talk about it for the fact that you looked at how he played in Penticton with the V's in the British Columbia Hockey League. 45 goals, 113 points in 54 games. That is really says something for how good he was. And then even looking at the playoffs that year, in 17 games, he scored 17 goals alone. So he was already a point per game just in terms of his goals. We also had 18 assists for 35 points. That tells you how good a guy like Bradley Nadeau was. And even his and even when he was playing with his brother Josh, like even Josh got over 100 points with Penn Tickton. So it's like you know that the raw talent is there for Bradley Nadeau. And that's why you've seen it in less than 300 days. It was, it was like 293 or 294 days since he got drafted by the Carolina Hurricanes. At the 2023 NHL entry draft, he went on to play his freshman year at the University of Maine and now has signed his ELC and has already made his NHL debut <laughs> at 18. And that just goes to show how good of a player he is and the fact of the raw talent and being able to go put on the on the stage in college hockey and, and did what he did in his freshman year. And he already thinks he's ready to go, and the Hurricanes think he is too. So just like Scott Morrow, it'll be really interesting to see where they put him next year. I He could be the NHL club team next year, but I wouldn't be surprised is whatever American League affiliate that the Hurricanes have. But those two guys are really, really going to be fun to watch in the coming future. So that'll wrap up segment two. Uh, like I said, big thanks to Huddy and uh, Sebastian from Locked on NHL Prospects for you know doing that little deep dive on Scott Morrow and Bradley Nadeau. But uh, we will – in the third segment, going to do some favorite Hurricanes fans moments from the regular season. We're going to do that here in a second on a Thursday edition of Locked on Hurricanes. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year, for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. And for me, the one good thing about having life insurance is the fact that it re- feels really good to be covered. I don't have to worry about if something happens. I know that insurance will be there to take care of any needs that I have. So it's, I would say it's very, very important to have something like that. And with Policy Genius, it helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts is on is on hand to help talk you through it. Talk to a team of award-winning agents who will walk you through the process step-by-step. Your work-life insurance policy may not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and which even worse, it may not come with you if you leave your job. But with Policy Genius, it gives you unbiased advice from a licensed expert support team. They also have no, they have no incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. Thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot from customers who found the best fit for their needs. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on NHL or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance close and see how much you can save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on NHL. Welcome back to a third segment of Locked on Hurricanes, your team every day. And we're going to finish out this show on a Thursday with something that would be really, really cool to do with fellow Hurricanes fans on social media. Thank you to everyone on Twitter, X, whatever you want to name it, for sending in your favorite moments of the 2023-2024 regular season thank you to the everyday if you sent one in yourself so i thought it'd be a kind of fun little thing to do you know with the fact that we know for sure that the first game of the round one for the carolina hurricanes is on saturday at five o'clock p.m you just make sure to keep an eye on that for game one on saturday and most importantly make sure to keep your eye on for friday because me and gil martin over at locked on islanders are going to do our crossover round one preview between both teams to make sure to watch out for the YouTube and also watch out for the podcast platforms as well for when that drops. But I digress. Let's jump into some very fun favorite regular season moments from fellow Carolina Hurricanes fans. So this one comes from Storm Cellar 97 
at the Storm Cellar. It's another Carolina Hurricanes podcast. Really great guys. Brad and Ray are absolutely amazing. I actually got to go to a hockey game with Brad, and that was the Seth Jarvis hat trick game on Cam Moore night. So big shout out to Brad and Ray. Um, so Brad says, sitting in the garden, talking about uh, in Boston at the at TD Garden, during the mom's game, as Jordan Flippin Martinuk streaks out alone and buries one, you can hear the air leave the building. And yes, that was a very, very fun mom trip because the moms even came home too and the, and the guys won at home with the moms being there. And the cool moment for me in all of that was the fact that you saw Jordan Martinuk on TNT with his mom doing an interview and you could tell it mean a lot to him when the guys from the TNT panel were asking him, you know, what's like playing in front of mom, you know, all that stuff. And you can see he was getting emotional because of the fact was just how much his mom, and of course, you know, his dad too, you know, supporting him, but you know, it's the guy, it's, it's mom. The guys want to win for mom. And just for the fact that he was able to bury the game winner against Boston, you know, the crowd goes quiet because at that time it was a tight game. And when he scored, it was like under two minutes left. And just being able to do what he did for the moms and ending a great night with a great win, it's something that's going to be very, very memorable. And you know that the guys love the mom trip. The guys love the dad's trip too, but it's always the next level one is the moms. But thank you, Brad. That was really, really cool. That, yeah, that was a really fun – Um, that was a fun one for sure in terms of the mom's trip. So – Another one came from Chrissy on Twitter at CPT Chrissy. She says the Aho OT winner versus the Devils on Whalers night. And that was, if you want to talk about electric, close, old school, old school, and I use an air quotes hockey, because you're talking about Whalers night. You're dropping the Whalers garb. The Coparals were back. So you got the pants back. You know, you got the vintage like, graphics, videos, all that good stuff, because the Hurricanes like marketing team and graphics team are absolutely amazing. The way they did all that was just great. It was just great. And the fact that the game ended in a one, nothing win from Sebastian Ajo, of course, in overtime shows you just how old school hockey that was, but it was so electric. It almost felt like a playoff game because of how close that game was. And Pierre Kachekov got a, a shutout in that game too, which is very, very important, but that was a lot of fun. And another one that she mentioned was the Martin Nietzsche's first period hat trick against the Colorado Avalanche back on March 8th. And I was actually at that game, not as pressed with the hockey writers, but I was there um, as a fan. Um, and it was a lot of fun. That was, if you want to talk about an electric start for the Hurricanes, you know, Martin Nietzsche goes get the hat trick against the Avalanche in the first period. And the thing was, though, that was a natural hat trick as well. So that took it to the next level where he was able to go do that. Scores three goals. Makes her a natural hattie. The Hurricanes do win the game despite the Avalanche. They did score two goals very, very late in the first period. The first period ends 3-2, but they went on to win the game. But just being able to see – to be able to see Martin Nietzsche's hat trick, let alone a natural hat trick, because I've never really seen a lot of hat tricks in person in my life. And for the fact that in back-to-back seasons, I saw Seth Jarvis do it on Cam Warren night, and then Martin Nietzsche's the next season goes and does it against the Avalanche. And it's a natural hat trick. I think it's the first time I've ever seen a natural hat trick in person. Like I said, I've seen hat tricks, but to see a natural hat trick, that was a lot of fun. So, Chrissy, two great options. Great games, great memories. Thank you for bringing those two up. That was really, really cool. And this one got a, <laughs> this one got a multiple responses. So I'm going to group everyone together. So this is from T- TML037. This was also... From Susan Mo, five six two six six three four one, and this last one came from Judge Wapner ten. If you know that name, if you know, you know, and you're a very great person. If you know that Judge Wapner reference, all three of them brought up the Aho Sebastian Aho game winner against Florida with 18 seconds left, and. Like I said with the Devils game, you thought that was a playoff atmosphere. This one against the Florida Panthers was an absolutely electric. It, it almost gave you the remembrance or PTSD or however you want to phrase it of the Eastern Conference final last year for the 2023 playoffs. So how those games were always tight. It was always decided by one goal game. 
And in this one, you thought it was going to go to OT. And, of course, you know, people are making the jacks by going to overtime. I even mentioned, all right, get ready for the longest four OTs of your, of your life, which, you know, it's regular season. But you get my point, though, because it's just we all we all remember game one of the Eastern Conference final where it lasted, like, four overtimes. The game didn't end until, like, two in the morning. But you thought it was going to go to overtime and another close one. And Sebastian Ajo just doing what he does, gets another game winner. You know, he had one against the Devils, and then this one he does it against the Panthers. And, you know, there was a little scrum after the game because you could tell the teams don't like each other. But just the atmosphere of that alone was so much fun just for the fact that you know it was a kind of like a preview to what a playoff matchup could be. And with how the playoffs are set themselves up, the fact that the Panthers won the, they won the Atlantic Division, congrats to them. It is what it is. Um as it stands, the Hurricanes, if if these two teams do meet up with each other, it's once again going to be the, going to be the Eastern Conference Final. And it'll be very, very interesting because the Panthers have to go play the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round, and the Carolina Hurricanes have to go play the New York Islanders in the first round. So almost the same type of first-round matchups, but, it's, but a little bit different, but it's going to be very interesting. But, yeah, that was an overall great game. Very electric, very nerve-wracking <laughs> for sure, but – didn't have to worry about going to overtime. Smash on home gets the game winner, and that's all said and done. But thank you to everyone who sent those in. That was a lot of fun. I might try to do more of that during the offseason, try to get more Kane's memories from the regular season. Hopefully get a lot of great playoff memories as well. Maybe do a playoff edition of what's your favorite Hurricanes moment from 2023-2024 season. But that will wrap up this episode of Locked on Hurricanes for a Thursday edition. Thank you, like I said, to the everyday or to make this your first listen of the day. It really means a lot. You know, it seems like everyone's really loving the episodes. You know, try and do this, you know, five days a week, Monday through Friday. Get you your daily episodes, podcasts, videos, whatever you want to call them, of your Carolina Hurricanes. Because, you know, this team is so much fun to watch. And to be able to get coverage on a daily basis is something that, not just for me, but just Hurricanes fans, just in general. It's kind of what you want for a team like this where they're a lot of fun to watch. They're, they're six straight playoff appearances and all that good stuff. So it's good to be able to do this for you guys. And just your support has meant a lot. You know, we're getting we're like three or four subscriptions away from 800 on YouTube. And the goal is to get to 1,000 because, you know, we want to try to do a giveaway. We want to do some special stuff for you guys once we hit 1,000. So make sure if you haven't, go subscribe. Hit the like button for the video let you know that you liked it and it helps with the algorithm and stuff like that. And make sure to hit the bell notification when you do subscribe and make sure to put it on all so you don't miss any episodes that do eventually come out for the YouTube side of things. And if you're listening to the audio side of it as well, make sure to subscribe, leave a five stars, and also leave a review because if you leave a review, I might just read it on the podcast. If you want to look for me, I'm a one true Zach on Twitter. That's only true Zach. I do have a link tree in my bio where you can find where I write articles for the hockey writers covering the Carolina Hurricanes as their beat writer, along with all the newsletters and Substack stuff that I do over there with them as well. And also, I'm at the Calder Time doing some AHL work on the site as well as helping them. And then you can find the links to the podcast and the YouTube channel for my other Hurricanes podcast that I do, the Surge Cast. It's, an, it's just one show a week, just a little bit longer format than you would get here locked on the Hurricanes which also you can get links from that link tree as well to find where you can lo- locate this podcast as well. So make sure to check, go check all that out. And if you want to follow the podcast on Twitter slash X, whatever you want to call it, LO underscore hurricanes and make sure to give that a follow as well. And like I said, thank you to the everyday for making this your first listen of the day. And until next time, as always, let's go Kings. <laughs>